Thank you, John and um, Jeff and Rod for a fantastic conference. Um, so my talk will not be so data heavy as what we've seen in the other uh, presentations. What I'm going to do is present an issue. And the issue is brought up frequently in low carb diet and brought up in this meeting, and that is LDL. LDL, fears of LDL rising with low carb diet. In fact, Dave Feldman said it very nicely yesterday that um, LDL is the boogeyman on the low carb diet. So my mind wandered and I started thinking of famous boogeymen in history. <laughs> and, and so what we have is in March of the Wooden Soldiers, we have this fierce looking boogeyman um, in fact, chasing down um, when he actually couldn't catch anyone in that movie. And the way to think about LDL actually is that it is fierce looking. We've been made to be afraid of LDL. We're going to lower the LDL with drugs such as statins. But in fact, this is an incredibly incompetent and, and inept boogeyman never actually ever caught Laurel and Hardy. So I want you to use this visual in my presentation to think about LDL as basically this boogeyman that looks fierce. But in fact, what I'm going to present in this half hour is try to convince you that in fact high LDL is healthy. High LDL, you want your LDL to be high. And under no circumstances should you be lowering your LDL with pharmacological approaches. All right, so why is it? <laughs> OK, I, I only have, yeah, don't applaud yet. I only have a half hour to change everything you've been told about LDL. Um, so why is a neuroscientist talking about cardiovascular disease? Because this is personal for me. Going back 20 years ago, I was diagnosed with dyslipidemia. Uh, I had astronomically high triglycerides, abysmally low HDL, and you plug in my numbers and there I am at the far right, in which I actually had a 15 times greater risk of developing an MI compared to someone with ideal lipids. Um, and so I was really concerned about this, and for 10 years I tried to beat it with low fat diet and with, with exercise, and basically I failed. Um, my story is at the Diet Doctor site, thank you Andreas. Um, in which I talked about how there was a moment in which my doctor sat me down and he said, I, this is urgent, you must go on a statin. I like to say that um, rather than go to the pharmacy, I went to the library. And so what I decided to do was learn about cardiovascular disease. I knew a good bit about the brain, essentially nothing about cardiovascular disease. Read a few papers and over the past 10 years, that's now extended to a few thousand papers. So in this half hour, I'm going to distill those few thousand papers <laughs> into a relatively brief summary. But I want to acknowledge as far first with my disclosure, I've been helped by so many people. Unfortunately, <laughs> and, and over the years, the font has gotten smaller and smaller. Um, but I just want to thank, it's like these are the people I respect. And it's only a subset of those who I've learned from. Uh, so, so first, a uh, massive number of people that I've learned from, and the ones with the asterisks I've interacted with directly and published papers. Uh, second, as far as the disclosure, I've had uh, 40 years of neuroscience research with an active program. I've been funded extensively by federal organizations as well as drug companies. Uh, but my cardiovascular research is entirely unfund unfunded. It's what I do on the side. So let's get down to some data, some concerns. Uh, here's a great paper reviewing cardiovascular uh, 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 carbohydrate restriction as the first approach to the treatment of diabetes, everything we've been seeing uh, in this meeting. And so you see all the biomarkers are going in the right direction. But there's the elephant in the room. It's in the room. It's hanging over your shoulders. Everything goes right. You lose your weight. You lose weight. You, you, lo you <laughs> drop your blood pressure. You drop triglycerides. You increase your HDL. But your LDL goes up. So now you think you have to go on a statin because you're, it's your LDL. So it's going to increase your risk for heart disease. So we've seen this a lot. Where did that come from, this idea that LDL causes heart disease? Uh, well, of course, we've seen often now uh, Ansel Keys, who came up with this idea, completely unjustified, without any basis whatsoever to say that you eat saturated fat, you increase your cholesterol, which then damages your arteries. Okay, This is 1961 perpetuated by the American Heart Association to this day. But it wasn't just Ansel Keys who came up with this. We've also got the second level. That's the connection of cholesterol to heart disease was by Brown and Goldstein, winners of the Nobel Prize, who tried and declared LDL guilty of causing heart disease, not just a risk factor. 1984, they said there is a causal relation between high LDL and atherosclerosis. So all they needed at the time then would be some data to prove that they were right. 
And so, <laughs> and so there wasn't much, and actually had been a very disappointing couple of decades from the time Ansel Keys said that cholesterol causes heart disease to now them winning the Nobel Prize for this study on familial hypercholesterolemia. And so data then became available. This is a Mr. Fit study, which came out in 1986. They followed over 350,000 men, got their cholesterol levels, and followed them for about oh, seven to 10 years. And so this is a frightening graph that you look at, because this is showing death from heart disease as a function of cholesterol levels. And cholesterol, total cholesterol tends to be associated with LDL, so you can make that extension. And so when you look on the left side, what you're looking at, the lowest cholesterol in those people would be 1.0, and going to 2.0 doubles your risk for heart disease, 3.0 triples it, and at 4.0 you've got four times the risk of developing heart disease and dying from heart disease. And so as you look at this scale, it is frightening because any small increase in cholesterol is associated with an increase in death from heart disease. So this is just what we needed at the time, was just what Brown and Goldstein needed, was to show a relation between uh, cholesterol and heart disease. So I read this paper, and I actually wanted to look at the raw data, because what you want to always be wary of is percent change or ratios. You want to look at the raw data. So what I'm going to show you is the raw data directly from this paper, and I'm going to plot it um, basically with blue bars, okay, to look at the actual risk to the population of the rate of death from coronary heart disease. So that's now going to be percent, the percent of people that did not die of coronary heart disease in blue. And here it is. Okay, <laughs> just take a look. Okay, the same data produced the blue bars as you have with the red bars. You can ask, how is that possible? Well, first I'm going to add a little visual. This is now, I added a line at 99%. So the first thing I want to emphasize, when you actually look at the raw data, what you are seeing is that about 99% of these men, middle age, did not die. Okay, so they really didn't cooperate very well with the study. <laughs> <laughs> so there's almost no death, and it's about 99% across the entire range, the entire physiological range of cholesterol. So how is it you can get the red bars derived from the blue bars? Well, if you actually look at the raw data, what you find is that people with the lowest cholesterol, 0.3% died of coronary heart disease. At the highest level of cholesterol, 1.3% died. So just a little below, just a little above, 99% across the entire range. It's far different from talking about a 400% increase in the rate of death when you talk about 1% across the entire range. So how do you have a 400% increase in death from coronary heart disease? It's kind of a statistical manipulation. I call it statistical alchemy. That you can create gold out of lead data. So all you have to do is now come up with a ratio. And you're going to see this now repeatedly in the cholesterol research. So you take the 1.3, which is on the right, divided by 0.3, and you end up with 4.13. That is how you create a 400% increase in death from coronary heart disease. So you see the deception that is already involved here. This is just one example to show you how deceptive this is. Why was it that Jeremiah Stamler presented the data in terms of red? And they came out with all the media activity, how you had to fear your cholesterol. Why did they choose that? Well, you had to support the idea that cholesterol was causing heart disease. Cholesterol at this point was too big to fail. Everyone had invested in cholesterol. So this is very important to understand. Now, let's actually look at the highest level of cholesterol. This is what we fear. We fear having extremely high cholesterol. So if your cholesterol is over 290, in general, you're at risk for heart disease and you're told to go on a statin. So let's look at the highest cholesterol. Now, the highest cholesterol you see from anyone is when you're diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia. Okay? So this is actually where no one wants to touch. People talk about the genetic components. These people have a higher rate of death from heart disease. Well, let's actually look at that. So in this disorder, what you've got is abnormality in the LDL receptor, so people have astronomically high cholesterol. So I have just a couple simple hypotheses and expectations. So if these people have a very high rate of death from coronary heart disease, then these people should die young. And the second is a pharmacological reduction of cholesterol should reduce coronary rates and mortality. Very simple expectations. Well, there are actually quite a few papers out there that have been ignored 
that show that people with FH actually have a normal lifespan. And this is just one of the early papers I found in which it states right there clear, and this is one of the most extensive studies ever published, over a thousand people. No evidence that people with FH have a shorter lifespan, that they live into the seventh and eighth decades. This doesn't make sense if cholesterol is killing you young. Now, this is an ancient paper. Some people have said, well, you can't depend on a 50-year-old paper. All right, well, let's go to a modern paper. The finding from Harlan et al. in 66 is replicated here in a very sophisticated study of people with FH. So you're looking at thousands of people in Norway in which you now have a genetic determination that they have FH in addition to having extremely high levels of cholesterol, including extremely high LDL. So you can ask the question about lifespan because they actually monitored these people for about 20 years and looked at the rate of death. Because ultimately that is the question. So you have high cholesterol, is that killing you young? So when you look at the rate of death from birth all the way to people over 80 years of age, what you find is a slight increase in all-cause mortality in the first couple of decades, first few decades, but it was not statistically significant. So people with FH are actually not dying at a higher rate. And in fact, as people get older, they're dying at a slower rate. In fact, when you get to the 70s, in which is, you have a high rate of heart disease killing people, the people who have the highest cholesterol actually have a lower rate of death. And the authors made this very clear. They state there were no significant differences in all-cause mortality overall for people with FH in the general Norwegian population, except from 70 to 79, they're actually dying at a lower rate. So the concern about having a patient with FH, that you must get them on a statin, you must get that cholesterol down, is not justified if you're concerned about that person dying. Okay? So, so this is something people don't normally want to think about. They're not aware of. These studies have been ignored. And there are half a dozen of these kind of studies out there showing normal lifespan in people with FH. Uh, and so to summarize this component, um, well, I've, done, uh, I've worked with quite a few uh, they're physicians, uh, physicians and, and uh, researchers, including cardiologists, and we re-reviewed uh, re all the papers that have been published on people with the highest LDL over the age of 60. And we did not find a single paper in which people actually died at a higher rate with the highest LDL compared to low LDL. And so overall, the conclusion is that people with the highest LDL are living as long and even longer than the people with low LDL. And here's our conclusion, which is in BMJ. Elderly people with the high LDL actually live as long or longer than those with low LDL. So there's reason to question why would anyone want to lower their LDL if they're actually living longer than someone with lower LDL. All right, so we now get to modern times. There are many different ways to lower LDL. Um, and I'm going to focus on two of them. Okay? So what we've got is actually one that's extremely efficient. It's called a CETP inhibitor. CETP is involved in the transformation of HDL into LDL. And it's extremely efficient. It increases HDL, it's called a good, uh, good cholesterol. It also decreases LDL as much as the statins. So it's actually even more efficient than the statins. The statins, of course, blocking HMG-CoA reductase reduces LDL primarily. <coughs> So I can summarize the entire literature on the CETP inhibitors with just a news report. We've got tens of thousands of people have been studied with this category of drug over 20 years. And it's right there in the news report. This drug, as it says there, reduces LDL, which they're calling dangerous. That's the bad LDL. And ultimately what they're saying is there was no benefit. You reduce the LDL you raise the HDL, and it has absolutely no effect whatsoever. And here Stephen Nichols says, this drug category seemed to do all the right things. I mean, raising the good, lowering the bad. And he said, this is a mind-boggling question as to why it didn't work. <laughs> well, no, the answer is very simple. If LDL isn't causing coronary heart disease, then lowering it makes no difference. And ultimately, pharmacological manipulations of HDL also don't matter. HDL rises naturally when people go low carb. It rises naturally when your blood sugar is low. Pharmacological manipulations of HDL just basically don't work. 
Of course, now we get to the statins. Okay, statins are the wonder drugs. And here actually is a study, so I don't have time to cover all the studies, obviously. So I'm going to cover one of the best, um, the one that ultimately drove Lipitor to generate over $100 billion in revenue. So this was a really important study. And here is an ad from the time in which Lipitor came out. So statins are the wonder drugs, producing huge reductions in coronary events and mortality. So here's the ad in which you see that Lipitor reduced the coronary events and risk for heart disease by 36%. So let's look at that study, published in The Lancet. And you can see that 36% is right there in their discussion. So I'm going to show you the actual data from the study. And it's right here. OK. <laughs> All right, let's just pause. I know I have, I have to go kind of quickly, but it's worth pausing on this. You have never seen this before, because this is not the kind of way in which you want to, uh, you'll see this at a, at a meeting put on by a pharma, uh, pharmaceutical company. Um, but here are the actual data from this study. Um, and somewhere in here is a 36% risk reduction when you compare placebo with atorvastatin, the Lipitor. So what I plotted here is actually the rate in which an adverse event did not occur. So an adverse event, for example, being death. Okay. So, so death did not occur. That would be survival. So if you look at survival, you see they're basically identical. No difference in mortality, no difference in mortality benefit. So where is that 36% benefit? Right there. You see that tiny sliver of a difference between the red and the blue bars? That is a 36% reduction. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I think it's actually worth just, let's just pause and look at that a little further. This is the wonder drug effect. This is the effect that propelled Lipitor to generate over $100 billion in revenue. How can that be a 36% reduction in risk? Well, the actual difference, I mean, when you calculate it and you look at the data, the actual difference is 1.1% in the difference in the rate of coronary events. And by the way, they had to combine non-fatal MI with fatal heart disease because otherwise there was no statistically significant, significant effect. So by combining it, they're able to turn that 1% to be significant. But still, how is it you turn that into 36%? And you look at the ad and it says it right there, 1.1% and 36%. Well, did you see the blue font on the blue background in the bottom? It's right there in the ad. It says, in a large clinical study, 3% of the patients taking the sugar pill or placebo had a heart attack compared to 2% taking the Lipitor. They're telling you the difference is 1%. It's right there in the ad. So how can it be both 1% and 36% at the same time? This is where you do some statistical hijinks. This is where you do statistical alchemy you turn a bad effect into a, what seems to be a good effect. You take that 1.1% difference between the groups. And then you have the difference between placebo and 100, which is 3%. If you're not following me, it doesn't matter, because it's a silly, right? It's, it's, like, it's, it's silly. So you take the 1.1 divided by 3, what do you get? You get 36. Okay, that's 36%. And that's why they say there is a 36% reduction. Understand that. And it's a bit like having a, a financial advisor who makes 1% for you in a year, and then next year he makes 2%, and he says, this is great news, I doubled your money. <laughs> He's still only making you 2% on your money, and it's time to drop that financial advisor. So this is playing with the data to make it into a ratio. Ratios are a way to deceive people, to see that there's a bigger effect than there really is. Yeah, and so this little fella here, this is the look. I have to tell you, I get this look from you. It's like, come on, seriously? <laughs> and when I lecture to physicians, even cardiologists, it's like, I had no idea they were, they were doing this to me. It's like, no, there's no Santa Claus, no Tooth Fairy, and statins really aren't the wonder drugs that they've been said to be. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So understand, what does that 1% mean? It actually means you treat 100 patients with statins. Only one out of that 100 people will have one less heart attack over three years. That's the wonder drug effect. And so if you have truth in advertising, I think the 1% should actually be in the ad. Libitar reduces heart attack by 
thing. And obviously that's not going to sell much in the way of Libitor, but that's the real effect. Now the Jupiter study, which came up yesterday, Jupiter study was heralded as one of the greatest studies ever in medical history. And here what people are saying about it. John Castellan, an author on the study, it's spectacular. We've actually prevented a first heart attack. Steve Nissen, Cleveland Clinic. It's breathtaking. It's a blockbuster. It's paradigm shifting. I mean, it sounds like he's talking about the next Bruce Willis movie, you know, <laughs> Die Harder. It's incredible. So let's actually look at the Jupiter study, in which you had healthy people with high CRP. So you're now looking at the effect of the statin. So this is what you'll see at a medical conference, the Jupiter outcome. And I got this off CME training. Um, so this is the Jupiter effect, massive 44% effect, and it looks very impressive. But if we look a little closer, what we have to realize is Jupiter was terminated at 1.9 years. So that extension of the curve doesn't matter. It's not a part of the analysis. So we cut back. This is actually the part of the curve that matters, and that difference is the 44% difference. Now prepare yourself, because this study had to be stopped on an ethical basis. So many people were being saved that they had to stop the study at this point of the curve. I'm now going to show you the actual curve, the actual graph as published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the 44% difference at 1.9 years. Those are actually two lines, the same two lines I just showed you. It's not my graph, this is cut and pasted out of the New England Journal of Medicine. 44% difference between those two lines. Oh, you got to see the looks on your faces. Okay, okay, everybody, close your mouths. <laughs> yes, I'm serious. Um, so this is how it was published, and this is what people are ignoring. It's right in front of you. It's kind of like doing magic. It is right in front of you, and you don't notice it. Now, I, I look at this, and I just have to say, I mean, come on, Steve. How is it possible you could look at the data and say, this is breathtaking, this is a blockbuster, this is paradigm shifting. How is it possible that he could come to that conclusion? All right, so when you actually look at the data, again, it's just like all the other studies, the effects are minuscule. And so <laughs> what was really a problem with the study is these are incredibly healthy people, they just failed to develop heart attacks. They did not cooperate at all in the study. So all of the data points, all the bars are almost at 100%. So these are healthy people, and so the difference between the drug and placebo is small, 1.2%. But in this case, you can now get to divide 1.2% by 2.8%. Again, it's difference between placebo and 100. It doesn't matter. It's just games that you play. This, this does not mean anything. Relative risk is completely useless. The only function relative risk has is to amplify the absolute risk. That's the only reason why it is around. So you take 1.2%, that's on the far left. The difference between the red and the blue is 1.2%. You create a 44% difference by dividing 1.2 by 2.8. Then you get to tell everybody this is a blockbuster drug. Well, I've had people tell me, okay, 1% is better than nothing. <laughs> and, and, and frankly, I'm amenable to that. If you treat 100 million people and you save 1%, that's a lot of people. So it's actually not such a bad thing. You are reducing coronary events if there just weren't so many adverse effects. There are so many adverse effects that have been ignored, they have been downplayed, but they're out there in the peer-reviewed medical literature. And this is just a subset. By reducing cholesterol, you're reducing the sex steroids, reducing testosterone. You're causing erectile dysfunction, kidney disease. Kidney disease because there is muscle atrophy. Everybody knows about the muscle atrophy, but there are other effects as well. What you've got, of course, is the type 2 diabetes. Now, back on that Jupiter study, why did they stop at 1.9 uh, years? Because people were developing diabetes. This is now extensively described in the literature. You've also got impaired motor performance, mitochondrial dysfunction, cataracts, acute renal failure, cancer, and liver dysfunction. And this is all in the peer-reviewed medical literature. And I'll just show you one study, because it's so important to the people here. Um, this has been downplayed. The diabetes risk with statins has been downplayed extensively. They say it's extremely rare. Well, this is one of the few studies that has actually taken measures, A1C, fasting blood glucose, prior to going on a statin and follow people for six years. Healthy people follow for six years. At the end of that period, the placebo group, about 6% developed type 2 diabetes, but the statin group, almost 12% developed diabetes. So you're looking at a real doubling 
at the rate of diabetes, which is about over 5% added on to placebo. So obviously that is now going to offset any potential benefits you might have from taking a statin. And as far as all-cause mortality, the evidence is very clear. So this is from primary uh, uh, treatment for heart disease. Absolutely no benefit whatsoever, and majority of people taking statins are taking it for primary prevention. And there's a trivial mortality benefit for secondary prevention. So you will not live longer taking a statin. So I have summarized uh, much of this work um, in work with Uvi Ravenskar. We published this a couple of years ago in Ex uh, Expert Review of Clinical Pharmacology. Uh, and so we described first elevated cholesterol it does not mean that you're going to. Uh, result in coronary heart disease, and in fact, having high cholesterol means you live longer. It's been deceptive. This has been decades of deception with the use of relative risk to amplify minuscule effects of these drugs. It has been deceptive now for almost four decades. The benefits of statins are clearly offset by the adverse effects. Okay. So if not cholesterol, then what actually causes cardiovascular disease? This is just another study in which you can see that people with familial hypercholesterolemia, those at highest risk, extremely high cholesterol, cholesterol over 350, LDL almost 300, and you have two groups, one with no heart disease, one diagnosed with heart disease, and equivalent lipids, especially equivalent LDL. So what's different between these groups? What's different is there are other genetic components that people have, even in familial hypercholesterolemia. People focus too much on the LDL receptor mutation. But what you have are other polymorphisms. And in this case, what you have is a polymorphism for prothrombin, a clotting agent. So clotting agents turn out to be crucial. And there are dozens of studies on people with FH that show that those that develop heart disease are the ones that have increased clotting factors such as fibrinogen and factor eight. So it is not the cholesterol. It is a subset of people with FH, just as a subset of people don't have FH. It is the clotting factors that increase your risk for developing heart disease. So I've been reviewing the literature, and looking to publish now this review, in which I've looked at the major risk factors for heart disease. And each one is ultimately linked to what they call angry clots, angry platelets. So what you have is clot formation as well as clot degradation or virinolysis. And when you look at the risk factors for death from heart disease, each risk factor increases clotting. So when people smoke, that increases platelet activation. Uh, getting old actually increases platelet activation, but the good thing is old people who exercise don't have that increased platelet activation. Stress and bacterial infection, big trigger for heart disease triggers platelet activation. And the important thing is those individuals of familial hypercholesterolemia that develop heart disease are the individuals that have greater clotting factors, and specifically those individuals that smoke. You combine smoking with FH, you have heart disease. Those that don't smoke, you see the difference. Those are the ones that tend not to develop heart disease. And as well, inflammation. Um, inflammation, I would say, is not really, is not the trigger for heart disease. Inflammation is a component but inflammation triggers platelet activation. And what's most relevant to this conference is the two at the top. Obesity, metabolic syndrome, high blood glucose, type two diabetes, all trigger platelet activation. So ultimately, when you're looking at the primary factors for cardiovascular disease, you are looking at platelet activation, as well as a reduction in fibrinolytic factors. So it's been about 10 years for me. Um, I Consider like a decade-long journey, which brought me here with you, diagnosed with dyslipidemia. Um, so by cutting carbohydrates, I've been able to reduce my triglycerides by 75% and increase my HDL by 25% to put my markers into a safe zone. So I've been able to reduce my risk just with diet without any medication. I've also learned about the deception in this field. I hadn't experienced this in my neuroscience research, so I really find it quite appalling at the deception in this field and the bullying that has gone on in which people fear that they must take a statin and physicians fear that if they don't prescribe a statin, so, uh, potentially you're going to be looking at malpractice lawsuit. So to summarize, um, what we've got, we started with a diet hypothesis, which is then promoted continually now by the American Heart Association, in which you've got leaders in the field largely paid by big pharma and food companies, in which they're preaching now to physicians who must follow these guidelines. 
So I would say there has been an offensive against saturated fat and cholesterol supported by the key opinion leaders who have been supported by food and drug companies. What I've tried to do in this very short period of time is convince you that high LDLC does not promote a premature death. And in fact, if I had more time, I would go into people with high LDL actually are significantly less likely to develop cancer and infectious disease. That's in, what, in fact why people with FH actually live longer and have a lower rate of death in their 60s and 70s because they're much less likely to develop cancer and infectious disease. So I would say I want to emphasize that there are very small benefits of statins on the order of about 1% better than placebo, but they are clearly <laughs> offset by the adverse effects that you see that, especially with type 2 diabetes, which is substantial, and it's been downplayed and ignored by the people in this field. And finally, what I want to emphasize then is what should be the target? What should people use then to focus on to reduce cardiovascular disease? We should be focusing on hypercoagulation, preferably not through medication, but preferably, preferably through diet and lifestyle changes. Thank you.